Uh, it's very exciting to be here. My father was born in Berlin, and if he were still alive, I think he'd get a little bit of a kick out of the fact that I was giving a talk to the German Neurological Society not that far away in, in Leipzig. I've never been here before. So it's wonderful uh, to be here. Um, I'm going to give you a very different kind of talk. Um, I'll start by saying that I don't know what a network is, actually. It's a word that evades all the time. I, I think that for you, those of you who are less familiar with these notions, you should know that they're like a Necker cube. They can fluctuate a little bit. On the one hand, you'll think a network means that all these cells will be connected, and in their connectivity, in their totality, they'll do the computation. But on the other hand, you have all this connectivity, and then you hear, like we heard in the first talk, that there's a unique connection between a region and another that's responsible for the behavior, and everything else isn't. So in the very heart of this network way of thinking, you have extreme modularity. And I think if you are confused, you're right to be, because I think the field in general can never quite make up its mind whether it's trying to talk about an ensemble computation or just that there's an enormous amount of connectivity and we have to zero in on the piece that matters. Um, now, when it comes to uh, neurology and thinking about these things, it's probably going to turn out to be quite specific to the modalities, whether you're in the motor system, the sensory system, or in more supramodal cortex. Um, so how do I advance here? The mouse. Oh, yes. So. Oh, OK. So, all right. So this is our website. Um, I always like to show this because, most importantly, please follow us on Twitter. I don't know how much you do that, but that matters. This is Johns Hopkins' original hospital. This is the new one. Um, and this is a rendition by an artist in our lab. So I look after stroke patients in ICUs and stroke units part of the time, not very much anymore. Um, but enough to know that patients after stroke unfortunately spend too much time immobile and alone. They spend about 60% um, of their time alone after acute stroke, a study out of Australia, and about 85% of the time immobile. And as you'll find out, uh, this is a terrible thing that we're doing to our patients at the current time. So back in 2008, um, we actually, to our surprise, discovered a rule for recovery after stroke, uh, where in fact, for the majority of patients, you could predict what their impairment recovery would be three months in the future by having just a behavioral measure early on. Uh, this, by the way, gets to another point that I'd like to make for us neurologists, that the best biomarker is actually behavior. And before you start looking for other things, make sure that looking at the patient isn't the best thing first. And it's remarkable that in the majority of patients, behavior, if it's well quantified, uh, can be a good predictor. You don't have to bypass it. And the rule basically said that if you, on the Fugelmeier scale, which is an impairment scale, if you had, an, and it goes from 0 to 66 for the upper limb, so if you have a 10, that's quite bad. You have 56 points you could potentially get back. You'd get about 70% of those points back at about three months. So for the majority of patients, except severe ones, you could actually predict there's some first-order dynamics to people's recovery. But as you can see, there are some people up here, the white ones, who don't obey that rule. It turns out about 50% of patients who are very plegic will not obey this rule. Okay. So there's some kind of endogenous repair process that's independent of the current rehabilitation that we give that is repairing the brain in the first three months. And here we are in 2017, and at the current time, there is no evidence that anything that we do as clinicians changes this rule beyond what the endogenous repair processes can do. All right? So at the level of actual repair, we don't do anything other than watch it happen as the patients spend that time alone in their hospital rooms. Okay. That doesn't mean that to say that rehabilitation isn't helping people cope, but it isn't adding at the current time to whatever this first order dynamic repair process is. All right? Now, if you do functional brain imaging, and you use multivariate forms of analysis, you can indeed see a quite distributed pattern of activation 
telling us that there's information beyond just the pathway that has been severed that seems to be predictive of future recovery. In other words, if you ask, is there any information in the brain that will tell you where people will be after accounting for how much of the variability in behavior at the time you were scanned is accounted for, there is indeed a pattern of activation that seems to be about the future rather than just the present. Now, you could therefore say, oh, that's a network, right? It's lots of areas. Presumably, they're connected ultimately, and therefore, there you go. There seems to be a distributed pattern of activation that seems to have some predictive power. All right? Now, whether that's functional connectivity or effective connectivity, we don't know. But this leads to another point I want to make, which is we tend to be very atheoretical. We use terms like connectivity, we use methodologies, and we hope that we'll find things out without really having a priori hypotheses about them. And I'll show you how one can get into trouble about that when it comes to uh, certain methodologies. Now, using functional MRI and using multivariate methods, we asked whether it was possible to use imaging to break the tie in those severe patients who did obey that proportional recovery rule, that 70% rule, and the people who didn't. In other words, could you add on some other modality, in this case functional imaging, to try and do a better job at predicting those patients who are severe, who will do what everyone else does, versus those patients who are severe and will simply flatline and remain plegic even at three months. Now, actually, this was a study we did uh, a while back, and we failed. Okay, uh, we, we, we got in the direction, and you can see this here, so these are the patients in black who are not falling on the prediction line, and then you add imaging, and you see they're beginning to move towards the prediction line, suggesting that perhaps more work of this kind could be begin to use imaging in addition to the behavior to bring everybody onto this prediction line. Um, but this was not significant, but we had reasons to believe that this was not a, um, uh, this, this was a, not a false negative. Th uh, this, was a, th this was potentially a false negative, I should say. Um, but nevertheless, it's suggesting that at least at the level of prediction, you can perhaps use information distributed across the brain in addition to a behavioral measure, or for example, measures of cortical spinal tract integrity to do prediction. Right? Now, to be clear, this is somewhat atheoretical. Right? Now, is this the right way to think about things? So I'm gonna to switch to the mouse, and this is uh, Steve Zyler, who had a, an NIH training award with me at Hopkins, and he, we developed a mouse model to try and get after a little bit more information about what's going on early after stroke. All right. Because this proportional recovery I told you about, where you get 70 cents back of what you could potentially get, happens in the first month or two, independent of treatment. So there's something special early on after stroke that we want to kind of exploit. So you can actually look at reaching movements in the mouse and the rat. I'm not going to talk about the arguments about whether it's appropriate to look at rodents when it comes to prehension. There are some very good arguments that have been made to suggest that you can actually look at prehension in rodents, because it is, in fact, a cortical-dependent behavior like it is in humans. Um, and so, on, in balance, I think, you, on balance, you can look at rodents to get some idea of what's going on in the brain after stroke. So, this is a mouse, and they can be trained. I mean, I, you probably, many of you don't work with these rodents, might not know that they have quite remarkable little hands like that, and you, this is early on where they rather use their mouth, they don't have table manners, but you can teach them to pick up objects, and you become quite strict, they have to pick up the object in one movement and get into its mouth, and you can train it over time, and that training in the mouse is motor, cortical, motor cortex uh, dependent. Now, you can then give these mice a stroke, uh, and then you can see, after you've trained them on this prehension task, how much rehabilitation they need and when do they need it to get back to where they were, if ever, all right? So you give them a stroke in their equivalent of motor cortex, so the red box is around their motor cortex. You can see that dark center here, that's their stroke. And then what you do is you pre-train them and then you rehabilitate them, all right? So we do a little bit, like you, I told you about the patients, and we try and reproduce that time they spend alone not moving by waiting a week before we start rehabilitating the mice after they've had their stroke. 
So there they are being pre-trained. They get to about 60% efficacy. This prehension task is t difficult for mice, right? So you give them 30 pellets. They're not going to get all 30 in one smooth move. They'll get about 60% of them. And then you give them that motor cortex stroke. As you'd expect, they drop down. And then what you do is you wait about a week, which is the time a patient is usually in the stroke unit before they go to acute rehab in the United States, and then you train the hell out of these little mice on the same task. And you can train them for three weeks, and you get very little return to where they were before. And even, so this is more intense than what human patients get, but you still can't get this mouse back to where it was after you waited a week after its stroke. But what about if you don't wait? All right. So what about if we give them a stroke and then go straight back after 24 hours and you get them back to normal? All right, so just not waiting, throwing the kitchen sink at them early on and you can get them back to normal behavior. All right, so there seems to be this time-dependent responsivity to training that falls off over time quite quickly and it sort of fits a little bit with the spontaneous recovery process that I was telling you about um, before in the humans. So you basically, if you delay, you get less bang for your buck per training trial in a rodent after stroke. Now, if that's true, why is it? So it leads to the paradoxical idea that maybe the best way to, train, to treat a stroke is to give an animal another stroke, all right? Because maybe that's the way you can reopen this critical period um, and get responsivity to training, even though it had run out because you waited too long. So that's what we did. We basically gave the animals a stroke. We waited, trained. Again, they flatlined. Then we gave them another stroke right next door to the original stroke in motor cortex, and they go back to normal. Kind of shocking that you can actually give an animal an additional stroke, which is now added to the volume of the original stroke, and you get them back to full recovery from their first stroke. Right. Now, as I always say when I present these data, we're not suggesting that we're going to start giving our patients second strokes in the hospital. But what we are saying is it is proof of concept that there is some special um, source early after ischemia that increases the plasticity in response to training. And we have to be able to do this uh, without the stroke. All right. Now, there are some clues about how to do this. One is, which I don't have time to go into in much detail, is if you give the uh, SSRI, Prozac, to these animals, like has done, been done in human studies, early after their stroke, you can actually wait the week before training, and they will actually return back to normal. But you have to give the SSRI, the, the serotonin reuptake inhibitor, early after the stroke in order to have this prolonged critical period. Uh, so, if you're going to do this in humans, like we at Hopkins, for example, all patients after stroke now, unless there are contraindications, will get an SSRI. This is specific. In other words, it's not anywhere. So if you give the second stroke, for example, in visual cortex on the ipsilateral side, you get no benefit from giving the second stroke. So it has to be uh, in the vicinity um, of the original stroke, or it has to be in a motor region with access to the spinal cord. We don't know which one that is. Now, what's interesting is if you then have these animals recover, you can give them a second lesion, right, without training, without training, and you can transiently, like you saw before, there was a dip before they started to improve in the medial premotor area, which was the region where we gave the second stroke. Now, if you give a lesion in that medial premotor area in a healthy mouse without giving the primary motor cortical lesion first, there's no behavioral deficit. You can see they barely feel that stroke. But if you give them that stroke, um, uh, you, you basically train them, give them the stroke, you have to train them up again in order to have them come back. And then you give them that lesion, and they also fall back down again. So in other words, getting to the idea of network, it does seem to be true that with training and these special conditions of plasticity after stroke, you do seem to get facilitation of spinal cord access in regions that are motor that previously were not doing it. Now, so in other words, you have to think to yourself, is this a network property? Is it a, the case that if a premotor region that previously didn't seem to matter for control of the poor after training and first stroke does assume functionality, 
that that's a network property, or is it just a training related upregulation of a region that has access of its own to the spinal cord, and we don't need to talk about connectivity between that region and primary motor cortex for that, all right? So it's a different way of asking what you mean by the word network. And it's interesting that if you look at the region that seems to reorganize, that is responsible for the return of function with training, it seems to be associated with a reduction in inhibitory interneurons in that region. And you can see, if you look in this ipsilesional premotor region, there seems to be a paucity of labeling for inhibitory interneurons in that region. And remember, this is a region that is unaffected by the stroke. So you see this reduction in inhibition in a region away from the stroke in the setting of training, all right? So one way to think about what's happening when you're reorganizing after stroke, at least in the motor system, is you seem to have a training-related reorganization of a region that already had access to the spinal cord and it had to be facilitated. Again, does this require thinking about connectivity cortico-cortically? I'm not so sure. Now, I'll quickly show you some evidence that there's a very short window in humans as well, if you look at motor control in particular. So we had a longitudinal study where we followed patients over a year and threw the kitchen sink at them in terms of modalities, structural imaging, functional imaging, psychophysics, brain stimulation. And suffice to say that you can quantify quite well people's movements, removing the possibility of compensating and removing the effect of weakness. You're just looking at the quality of motor control, subtracting out strength and subtracting out compensation. And in the interest of time, um, I will show you, you can do that. This was a study that we did over time. I'm gonna show you the arm kinematics only. This is work done by uh, a fellow in the lab, Juan Camilo Cortez. You can quantify reaches with a uh, planar psychophysical task. Uh, pe pe people make straight out and back movements on a table with friction removed and gravity removed. It's a very good way of quantifying movement. All of you in this room would make straight movements like that. Patients after stroke will have curved, inaccurate, highly variable movements like you see here on the right. You can mathematically quantify how close these trajectories are to healthy trajectories on the left, so you can get a scalar quantity telling you how close you've come to true motor control, healthy motor control. And if you quantify that trajectory, those trajectories that way, you can see on the y-axis, you simply have a bias in what we call the Mahalanobis distance, which is basically just a distance in multi-dimensional space from the healthy population. And you see that all the recovery in humans of motor control is over within four or five weeks. All right, so it's somewhat similar to the lack of responsiveness to training in the mice uh, after a very short period of time. So we have a problem. We have about a month to try and do better than endogenous repair uh, in humans. So can a network framework help explain all this? So this is a figure from brain, and this is something that many of you will see. You'll have a spaghetti of regions. Um, these are the motor regions, and then there'll be all these potential connectivities between them, uh, and there are ways to address this connectivity in humans using resting state, bold, uh, looking at correlations in low frequency, bold signal between regions. It's an industry these days doing it because it's much easier. You just put the person in the scanner. You don't actually have to come up with a good task. And there are all sorts of correlational studies that have been done. Now, what I'd like to say to you in this audience is the problem with this approach is if, you were to, uh, if I ask people, and I have, because I'm obnoxious, who do these kind of studies, um, why do you think a connection between the SMA and the dorsal premotor cortex matters to recovery of reaching movements? You have a connectivity measure that goes up, you have a connectivity measure that goes down, who cares? What's the theory? But the thing is, is because it can be quantified, one can go correlation hunting. Now, correlation hunting isn't as good, obviously, as causation hunting, which is what we heard in the first talk, right? But nevertheless, they're both a little bit atheoretical, right? So what happens if you take a very careful look at this kind of approach um, and see whether it can actually tell you anything about why people are getting better in this period and showing this dramatic treatment-independent repair.
So we followed patients and did resting state, and we th threw every method that's being used in resting state, and we looked at connectivity between hemispheres, and we looked at connectivity um, within hemispheres, within all these regions. All right, and I'll tell you the result of what we found when we try to look at all these connectivities, cortico-cortical connectivities, and relate them as a definition of reorganization to recovery. Now, before I get there, there's another way that you can get at connectivity, which is very, very, very popular right now in stroke, which is the hemispheric imbalance model. And this idea is that when you have a stroke, and you can see the stroke over here, there's a sudden imbalance between the hemispheres where the healthy hemisphere starts to have excessive inhibitory influence on the damaged hemisphere. So in a sense, the poor stroke hemisphere suffers a double hit. It's had its stroke, and it's now being excessively inhibited by the healthy hemisphere, which has led, again, to an industry of people trying to use brain stimulation, whether it's TDCS or TMS, to calm down the healthy hemisphere to give the damaged one a chance. All right. So this is a kind of network model. Again, a very cortico-cortico-centric view. That there's chatter between cortical regions, and if we could just work out what that chatter means and do something about it, we're going to get recovery of the arm back. All right. Now, there is a very influential paper by um, Leo Cohen and his group where they basically looked at a form of inhibition between the hemispheres, and in the interest of time, I'll simply tell you that what you do is you give people a go signal, they move their finger, this is the EMG after the go signal, and what you can do is you can interrogate the state of inhibition from one hemisphere to the other at various reaction times before the finger is moved. And this is what's plotted in the healthy volunteer here and in the patient here. And what you can see is in the build-up to movement, this double arrow is when the movement onset is of the finger movement, when the EMG happens, you see that you go from a state of inhibition to a state of at least neutrality or excitation. So in other words, you release the inhibition in all of us when we're about to move in the contralateral hemisphere. But in the stroke patients, what they found, these are chronic patients, these are people well out side of six months, they seem to not succeed in releasing the inhibition prior to movement onset. And then what they did in this study is they correlated that with some kind of measure of deficit of paresis in this population. Now again, interesting study, but no theory provided as to why this inhibition would matter for the quality of the movement. At the very least, at the worst, it would probably have an effect on the reaction time. Right. But if it's true that this hemispheric imbalance is a contributor to hemiparesis, and your hemiparesis is worst early after stroke because you're recovering, then what you really need to do to test this hypothesis is to check whether this hemispheric imbalance is present early after stroke when you're at your worst. And the answer is it's not. And here you are looking at this IHI may very early on in the first three months in controls versus patients, and then you see what they reported is you do have abnormal IHI in the chronic population, but it's completely normal early. So in other words, as your IHI is going from normal to worse, the patients are getting better. Hardly the directionality you'd expect if this was causative for the parasis. All right. So here was a methodology-driven, attractive, somewhat simplistic, interhemispheric network idea that basically looks like it's wrong. All right. And yet, countless studies have been done based on this model of trying to treat patients with TMS, and as the recent meta-analyses have shown, nothing is working. Um, and I'll finish by showing you the equivalent of our resting state study. And all I want to show you on the top here is these dramatic improvements in these 20 patients who were followed after stroke. This is the Fugelmeyer, this is the ARAT, this is hand strength. And down here, what you're seeing is changes over time in interhemispheric and intrahemispheric connectivity, in other words, M1, 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 PMD, M1, PMV, M1, S1, all the ones that have been published in the literature. And the somewhat shocking result 
is A, there's no change whatsoever using these measures in cortical cortical connectivity in any of the areas that were pre-specified, nor is there any difference in the actual pattern of connectivity when you compare the patients with a leave-one-out analysis to normal controls, age-matched, who are also tracked longitudinally over time. So, whether it's the TMS-inspired network theory of recovery, which looks like it's on its last legs, or it's a resting state connectivity model of cortical connectivity while patients are recovering, we have this unfortunate situation where the patients are showing dramatic behavioral changes, and our measures of network connectivity are showing nothing. Now, there are two ways to interpret those results. One is the methods just suck, right? That they're just not giving us what we want. Or it's the wrong framework, at least for the motor system. I am not going to generalize that to things like language and other cognitive uh, areas. So the answer, I think, for the motor system is a network framework has not been helpful. Resting state connectivity measures and interhemispheric model were both technique-driven rather than theory-driven. So in retrospect, and it's always easy to say in retrospect, it was not very clear to me, at least, why anyone thought they were going to tell us why reaching gets better. All right. So what I think we need to say instead is what I was hinting at before, which is we have to say, look, we have regions of the brain that already have architecture for behavior, like a premotor region. We know the premotor regions can project to the spinal cord. And it looks as though those regions with training, just like experience dependent plasticity during normal development, can strengthen their connections to muscles through behavior if they have that intrinsic architecture to begin with. There is no magic reorganization of regions that didn't already have that architecture. And what we have is a very unique time period, early after stroke, where training seems to be really good at facilitating these cortico subcortical connections. So we have to be thinking much more about cortical regions and their spinal cord and brainstem targets and stop fixating on cortico-cortical connectivity changes or interhemispheric changes. And for example, this is a work by Warren Darling where they showed exactly what I'm saying is that they took a patient with a stroke in M1 and they looked at the strength of the connections from the SMA down into the ventral horn of the spinal cord. And very interestingly, and you can see this in the thick black arrows, you had an increase in the strength of the projections that were already there pre-stroke, but now were facilitated in the setting of training. And you're going to have to explain to me why you think, in order to explain that kind of result, you have to have some sort of special measure of connectivity between M1 and M2. It might be true, but I want a theory as to why I need an M1, M2 change in order to get the facilitation of the M2 projection with training to the ventral horn. And unfortunately, the resting state connectivity measures that have been obtained have been done without providing us with a theory as to why there should be a connectivity change and why would a connectivity change using that correlational method mean something from a biological standpoint. So what I would finish with is what I think is going on in a way to sort of combine the rodent literature, the monkey literature, and the human literature is what we're seeing is a kind of a model which we've just um, talked about in a book that's coming out in November is that restitution, in other words, true recovery of behavior, is a function of the type of behavioral training dose that you give, plus there being some residual representation that was already there before the injury, you're not gonna turn a leg area into an arm area or a face area into an arm area. It's not true, all right? And then you want some sort of plasticity level that will interact with the behavior and the initial representation. And so you can see that if you have a subtotal lesion in motor cortex and a lot of residual good architecture left in motor cortex, then you're not gonna need that much training to get spontaneous recovery. But if you lose all of your primary motor cortical representation and now you have to fall back on your premotor representation, spontaneous recovery isn't gonna do it and you're gonna to have to up your behavioral dose and get some help 
from this unique plasticity that is available very early. And if you miss that, you don't give the training in that window, and spontaneous recovery simply can't do the work alone on the remaining representation, then you're going to be left uh, with poor recovery. All right. So in my view, a modular view, a little bit what like Carl talked about with the medial prefrontal cortex going down to the herbenula, right? amongst all that connectivity, it was that unique connection. And I think in the motor system, it's similar to that. It's what are the connections down to the spinal cord and the brainstem, whether it's the corticoreticular spinal system or the premotor down to the ventral horn, that you can behaviorally enhance. And we're simply, I think, barking up the wrong tree, going on and on about hemispheric interactions and even cortico cortical interactions uh, when it comes to the motor system. And I'll stop there. And these are my sponsors. And thank you very much. <laughs>